All right, greetings and salutations. My name is Comic Fire, and welcome to episode one of my dramatic reading of Kitawa Shoujo, a visual novel that I should probably be embarrassed about loving so much. <clears throat> now let us begin. A light breeze causes the naked branches overhead to rattle like wooden wind chimes. This is a popular retreat for couples in the summer. The deciduous trees provide a beautiful green canopy, far out of sight of teachers and fellow students. But now in late winter, it feels like I'm standing under a pile of kindling. I breathe into my cupped hands and rub them together furiously to prevent them from numbing in this cold. Just how long am I expected to wait out here anyway? I'm sure the note said 4 p.m. Ah, yes. The note slipped between the pages of my math book while I wasn't looking. As far as clichés go, I'm more of a fan of the letter in the locker, but at least this way shows a bit of initiative. As I ponder the meaning of the note, the snowfall gradually thickens. The snowflakes silently falling from the white-painted sky are the only sign of time passing in this stagnant world. Their slow descent upon the frozen forest makes it seem like time is slowed to a crawl. The wrestling of dry snow f underfoot startles me, interrupting the quiet mood. Someone is approaching me from behind. Ha, Hisao? You came? A hesitating, barely audible question. However, I recognize the owner of that dainty voice instantly. I feel my heart skip a beat. It's a voice I've listened to hundreds of times, but never more than as an eavesdropper to a conversation. I turn to face this voice, the voice of my dreams, and my heart begins to race. Why are you wearing a skirt in the winter? You wanna go? I got a note telling me to wait here. It was yours? Damn it. I spent a whole afternoon trying to come up with a good line, and that was the result. Pathetic. Yes, I asked for a friend to give you that note. I'm so glad you got it. A shy, joyous smile that makes me so tense I couldn't even move a single muscle if I tried. My heart is pounding now, as if it were trying to burst out from my chest and claim this girl for itself. So, uh, here we are, out in the cold. Once again, the wind stirs up the branches. The cacophonous noise is music to my ears. Iwanako flinches ever so softly against the gust of wind. As it passes, she rights herself, as if supported by some new confidence. Her eyes lock with mine, and she lazily twirls her long, dark hair around her finger. All the while, the anxious beating of my heart grows louder. My throat is tight. I doubt I could even force a word out if I tried. You see, I wanted to know if you'd go out with me. I stand there motionless, save for my pounding heart. I want to say something in reply. But my vocal cords feel like they've been stressed beyond the breaking point. Is so? that? I don't care, performance alert. I reach up to try to massage my throat, but this only sends spikes of blinding pain along my arms. My whole body freezes, save for my eyes, which shoot open in terror. The beating in my chest suddenly stops, and I go weak at the knees. The world around me, the canopy of bare branches, the dull winter sky, Iwanako running towards me, all these fades are black. The last things I remember before slipping the way are the sounds of Iwanako screaming for help and the incessant clatter of the branches above. Four Leaf Studios presents... Kitawa Shoujo. I'm not gonna read out the credits. Even though this is a dramatic reading, I suppose I should. Corporal Crud! That name always stuck out to me. And Silent Cook. <laughs> Call me Fish and Penny. Timmy Fana! <laughs> Should I just remain quiet when there's nothing really to look at? <laughs> Tick. Top. 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 T
one says him. Anyway, this is filler for the weekend since I've just got stuff going on with the capture card. So, no Dark Cloud, Final Fantasy VII. And I'm just too lazy to go back to Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explores the Sky. So, you guys get Katawa Shoujo. It's been four months since my heart attack. In that whole time, I can probably count the times I've left this hospital room unsupervised on one hand. Four months is a pretty long time when you're left alone with your thoughts. So I've had plenty of time to come to terms with my situation. Arrhythmia. A strange word. A foreign alien one. One that you don't want to be in the same room with, you racist. <laughs> a rare condition. It causes the heart to act erratically and occasionally beat way too fast. It can be fatal. Apparently I've had it for a long time. They said it was a miracle that I was able to go on so long without anything happening. Is that really a miracle? I guess it was supposed to make me feel more better, more appreciative of my life. Well, I didn't do anything to cheer me up. My parents, I think, were hit harder by the news than I was. They practically had two hemorrhages apiece. I had already had a full day by then to digest everything. To them, it was all fresh. They were even willing to sell our house in order to pay for a cure. Of course, there isn't a cure. Because of the late discovery of this condition, I've had to stay at the hospital to recuperate from the treatments. When I was first admitted, it felt as if I was missed. For about a week, my room in the ward was full of flowers, balloons, and cards. But the visitors soon dwindled, and the get-well gifts began trickling down to nothing shortly after. I realized the only reason I'd gotten so many cards and flowers was because sending me their sympathy had been turned into a class project. Maybe some people were genuinely concerned, but I doubt it. Even in the beginning, I barely had visitors. By the end of the first months, only my parents came by on a regular basis. Iwanaka was the last to stop visiting. After six weeks, I never saw her again. We never had that much to talk about when she visited anyway. We didn't touch the subject that was between us on that snowy day ever again. The hospital? It's not really a place I'd like to live in. The doctors and nurses feel so impersonal and faceless. I guess it's because they're all in a hurry and have a million other patients waiting for them, but it makes me feel uncomfortable. For the first month or so, I asked the head cardiologist every time I saw him for a rough estimate of when I'd be able to leave. He never answered anything in a straightforward way, but told me to wait and see if the treatment and surgeries worked. So I idly observed the scar that those surgeries had left on my chest slowly change its appearance over time, thinking of it as some kind of an omen. I still ask the head cardiologist about leaving, but my expectations are low enough that now I'm not disappointed anymore when I don't get a reply. The way he shuffles around the answer shows there's at least some hope. At some point, I stopped watching TV. I don't know why, I just did. Maybe it was the wrong kind of escapism for my situation. I started reading instead. There was a small library at the hospital, although it was more like a storeroom for books. I began working my way through it, one small stack at a time. After consuming them, I would go back for more. You ain't supposed to eat books, man. I found that I liked reading, and think I even became a bit addicted. I started feeling naked without a book in my hands. But I loved the stories. That was what my life was like. The days became increasingly harder to distinguish from each other, differing only by the book I was reading and the weather outside. It felt like time blurred into some kind of gooey mass I was trapped inside instead of moving within. A week could go by without me really noticing it. Sometimes I'd pause in realization that I didn't even know what day of the week it was. But other times, all the things that surrounded me would painfully crash into my consciousness through the barrier of nonchalance I had set up for myself. The pages of my book would start to feel sharp and burning hot, and the heaviness of my chest would become so hard to bear that I had to put the book aside and just lay down for a while, looking at the ceiling as if I was going to cry. But that only happened rarely. And I couldn't even cry. Today, the doctor comes in and gives me a smile. He seems excited, but not very. It's like he's trying to make an effort to be happy on my behalf. My parents are here. It's been a few days since I've last seen them. Both of them are even sort of dressed up. Is this supposed to be some kind of special occasion? It's not a party. This is the ritual the head cardiologist has. He takes his time sorting his papers, then setting them aside as if to make a point of the pointlessness of what he just did. Then he casually sits down on the edge of the bed next to mine. He looks me in the eyes for a moment. Hello, Hussao. How are you today? I don't answer him, but I smile back a little. Adam. I believe that you can go home. Your heart is stronger now, and with some precautions you should be fine. We have all your medications sorted out. I'll give your father the prescription. 
The doctor hands a sheet of paper to my dad, whose expression turns wooden as he reads it quickly. So many. I take it from his hand and take a look myself, feeling numb. How am I supposed to react to this? The absurdly long list of medications staring back at me from the paper seems insurmountable. They all blend together in a sea of letters. Propanolol! This is insane. Side effects, adverse effects, contraindic contraindications and dosages are listed line after line with cold precision. I swear to God, Cat, if you just start screaming at me, I'm not going to be happy. What? I try to read them, but it's so futile. I can't understand any of it. Attempting to only makes me feel sicker. All this for the rest of my life every day? I'm afraid this is the best we can do at this point. However, new medications are always being developed, so I wouldn't su be surprised to see that list fade over the years. Years. What kind of confidence booster is that? I'd have felt better if he hadn't said anything at all. Also, shall we... Also, I've spoken with your parents, and we believe that it would be best if you don't return to your old school. What? Please calm down, Asal. Listen to what the doctor has to say. Calm down. The way he says it tells me he knew full well that I wouldn't like it. Am I going to be homeschooled? Whatever my concern shows, it's ignored. We all understand that your education is paramount. However, I don't think it's wise for you to be without supervision. At least not until we assure that your medication is suitable. So I've spoken to your parents about a transfer. It's a school called Yamaku Academy that specializes in dealing with disabled students. Disabled? What? Am I... That's a 24-hour nursing staff, and it's only a few minutes from a highly regarded general hospital. The majority of the students live on campus. Think of it as a boarding school of sorts. It's designed to give the students a degree of independence while helping keep being help nearby. Independence? It's a school for disabled kids. Don't try to disguise that fact. If it was really that free, there wouldn't be a 24-hour nursing staff, and you wouldn't make the hospital be nearby a selling point. Of course, that's, uh, only if you want to go, but your mother and I ain't really able to homeschool you. We went out there and had a look a couple weeks back. I think he'd like it. it. Looks as though I don't really have a choice. Compared to other heart problems, people in your condition usually tend to live long lives. You'll need a job one day, and this is a good opportunity to continue your education. This isn't an opportunity. Don't call it an opportunity. Don't call it a goddamned opportunity. Well, you should be excited at the chance to go back to school. I remember you wanted to return to school, and while it's not the same one... A special school, that's... an insult. That's what I want to say. It's a step down! It's not what you think. All the students there are pretty active in their, uh, own sort of way. It's geared towards students that can still get around and learn, but you need a little, you know, help in one way or another. Your father's right, and many of the graduates of the school have gone on to do amazing things. A person doesn't have to be held back by their disability. One of my colleagues is another hospital is a graduate. I don't care. A person doesn't have to help be held back by their disability? It's what a disability is! I really hate that something so important was decided for me, but what can I do about it, you know? A normal life is out of the question now. It's funny. I always thought my life was actually kind of boring, but now I miss it. I want to protest. I want to blame this lack of reaction on shock or fatigue. I could easily yell out something now, something about how it can go back to school anyway. But, no. I don't say anything. The fact that I know now is futile. It's futile. I look around the room feeling very tired of all this. That hospital, doctors, my condition, everything, I don't see anything that would make me feel any different. There really isn't a choice. But the thought, I know this, but the thought of going to a disabled school, what are those even like? As much as I try to put a positive spin on this, it's very difficult. Excuse me. But let me try. A clean slate isn't a bad thing. That's all I can think to get me through this. At least I still have something. Even if it is a special school, it's something. It's a fresh start and my life isn't over. It would be a mistake to resign myself to thinking that. At the very least, I'll try to see what my new life will look like. Welcome to Act 1, which we will cover in the next episode.